is Dr. Zhang Haichaojiang from Baidu Institute of Deep Learning, and myself from Texas a and and uh, Professor Jie Huo Luo from Uni University of Rochester. So first, uh, let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Hai Chaojiang, who is a research, senior research scientist in Baidu Research. He was previously a research scientist in um, Amazon Seattle after completing a postdoc in Duke University. He is an uh, experienced uh, researcher in image restoration, video processing, machine learning, and more recently NLP. And uh, he's a recipient of uh, ICCP 2011 Best Student Paper Award. So let's please join me in welcome Hai Chao. So this is the first part of the tutorial uh, on uh, low quality uh, video data processing and, and analytics. <coughs> so this is the outline. We will start from the image formation in real world. And then we uh, uh, present a general mathematical uh, framework for dealing with uh, uh, one specific type of blind restoration problem. And we, uh, based on this, we will show uh, the extension and generalization. Uh, in the end of the, this part, this first part, we will um, briefly touch the idea of joint restoration, which we how to connect the low level processing and handling. So let's start with the image formation part. So, as far as the imaging devices everywhere, we have uh, Many kinds of smartphones with uh, built-in cameras, of course. And we have uh, many kinds of surveillance cameras installed on the world. Um, while our goal is to uh, capture a high-quality, uh, sharp image, what in practice we thought is a typically blurry and many times blurry image, or low-quality <coughs> image, because of many factors. Let's see, uh, camera shake, uh, long distance, out of focus. Object so those kind of degradations in real world pose um, mainly two kinds of two categories of challenges. One is a visual perception part, which is related to the low uh, low level vision part. The second is uh, the more related to the high level vision part, which is the machine perception. So the first part there have, there have been many um, effort, uh, there have been long term efforts on recovering high quality data from the low level of the region. Um, such as like noisy, which is the most simplest form of restoration. Super resolution, which is to try to recover high uh, high resolution version from low resolution of the region. Or blind blurry, which is trying to get a sharp image from uh, only one blurry uh, of the region. And for the high level part, we are trying to deal with how to deal with the problem of how to do robust machine recognition from only the low level, uh, low quality of machine. <coughs> In this first part, I will focus only on the first part. Most likely, it's blind image debugging with one particular type of structure to try, which is fast drive. So the color blur, as I mentioned, is um, mainly the kind of motion blur is mainly caused by the relative motion between the object and the cameras during the uh, image decoder period. So in the very simplest case, this process can be described by the simple convolutional model, which is the sharp image act and con uh, convolved with the blur kernel, which describes the uh, camera motion, and with adequate noise at the end, no doubt the blurry image. So this is the simplest case. We will show how to generalize of the model to be more realistic in the later part. So the um, task of blind image blurry is try to estimate both the sharp image x and blurry image y given only single uh, blurry observation uh, y. So this is a very challenging problem. As you can see, because we are trying to estimate both two um, quantity x and k from only a single quantity y. So this is E opposed because there are many uh, pairs of solutions, x and k, which convolve together can satisfy this equation. This is explain y equals y. So 
for example, uh, the blurry image Y can be described as the sharp image, uh, X here, and the blur kernel, which is a delta kernel, meaning there is no blur. This is called the no blur solution. And also, among all those pairs, there is only one pair, which is a sharp image and the true blur kernel, so which is the pair of solution we are, we are seeking. So typically, uh, we deal with this kind of problem with, uh, we can start with the basic information. So starting from the observation model, we can build a likelihood uh, <coughs> here. And this is very ill opposed the problem if we just do maximum likelihood, as I mentioned before. So we uh, use a very common image prior, which is the sparsity prior. So for example, we can um, say the image, image the pixels values is sparse in the sum domain, like, let's say gradient domain. So this is kind of a general formulation. Starting with this uh, likelihood and prior, one natural approach to solve this problem is we do a maximum likelihood. So basically, which is equivalent to uh, minimize the negative log likelihood, which is um, basically this Minimization of this regularized, regularized problem. Here. This uh, this straightforward solution. There are um, a lot of problems with this straightforward solution. One most severe problem is the so-called local minimum problem and no blur solution. Because in practice, if you minimize, if you solve this optimization problem directly, if you solve this. Uh, problem directly, you will got a no blur solution as we mentioned before. Basically you recover an X which is equivalent to the original blur image one. And you got a further kernel estimation, which is a delta a delta kernel. So you, you make no progress uh, in terms of which solution. So why this is the problem. So we will uh, from uh, we will uh, solve this problem from a different angle and we will say why this is a better solution. So we uh, start from the same likelihood as two here. For image prior, we also use a, we also leverage the sparsity in the gradient domain. And we here, we start from a diagonal Gaussian here. But the diagonal, the variance will be happening. So you will see later, it's a sparsity prior. And instead of doing maximum, um, instead of maximize the, Likelihood directly. We here we use a we first marginalize over X, which is an unknown sharp image, and then we maximize over all the other unknown. This is complicated, but we can reduce it to a more similar form, which is again a minimization of this function, which is more similar to a, a regular regularized formulation. So what's it? This is a four uh, form of the cost function. This is the very common the construction system. When x convolved with k, it should be close to the observation. What is different here is the penalty term. So this penalty term is coupled over x, the sharp image, the blurry, uh, the blur kernel k, and the uh, unknown noise level lambda. So it is this uh, coupling. That is unique compared to the previous penalty term. As here, there is a high dimensional uh, determinant involved. We use a, a diagonal upper bound to approximate and to uh, simplify for. As I mentioned, this is, looks similar to the previous um, formulation, uh, assuming the below. So what's the real difference here? Why this is better than the previous formulation? So to answer this question, we revisit the challenge which I mentioned at the beginning, which is the ill potent. <coughs> so the reason, the only reason we want to use a sparsity prior is we want to elevate this ill potent, meaning we want this sparse prior to favor the true solution, the, which is the sharp image. So here we can show that the uh, effect of blur actually has two 
different uh, effects. First, it will reduce the sparsity of the signal. Um, so, if you reduce the sparsity of the signal, if you use a sparsity um, provider, this actually favors the favors the sparsity prior. If it's not uh, sparse enough, it will favor your favor your actual observation, the blurry image. So the second factor is it will reduce the sparsity of the signal. So basically, if it's better explain in this graph, if your sparsity prior is not strong enough, actually this second part, the reduce of the variance because of the blur, will dominate. So if your sparsity prior is not sparse enough, it will actually favor the blurry observation of the image because of the, the second factor, the reduction of the variance. To really favor the sharp image, so we have to actually, this shows the LP norm here. You have to use a really sparse prior over your image. Meaning this prior, ideally, it should be approached to L0 norm. But this really poses a challenge on optimization. So because this is a non convex optimization problem, so based on this observation, we can further analyze the uh, penalty or the cost uh, of the prior we developed before. So firstly, it's a very it's a qualified, very concave or very sparse prior because, as you can show, as lambda approaches zero, this penalty actually approached L zero norm, which is a ideally the most sparse form of. And secondly, it also avoids the local minima issue, which is on the optimization perspective. Because <laughs> in the beginning, because the noise level estimation is large, so at the beginning, this penalty term is actually approaching a L1 norm, which is a convex form of a penalty function. So this helps uh, your optimization side. As the lambda re get reduces, actually, it actually get more concave, basically introducing more convexity, meaning it's more sparse. And what's the implication, implication of this prior? Initially, as our noise level is large, this penalty function is less concave. So at this stage, only the large scale structure will get recovered. You will focus on the large scale structure first, regardless of the low, uh, low, low level detail. And as this Noise level estimation get reduced. This penalty function is actually introducing more convexity, meaning it got uh, it approaching a more sparse penalty. So at this stage, more fine detail structure will be uh, will be get recovered. So let's see some, uh, let's see some results. So this is one blurry image. From this single image, we want to estimate the sharp version and also the blur kernel, which is the camera motion. So this is the one of the earliest approach, um, the further setup. This is another approach. This is our approach. We can uh, compare some video here. Um, you can see the camera motion move recovered by our approach is uh, more continuous. Approach. But here, there's a the projector, there's some the resolution is limited, so we can see the So this is actually what I present just now is the general formulation for what I will, I will show below. What I will show in the following is several extensions based on this formulation. So first one is that we, uh, what we just started is, is a simple observation model, which is a convolution model, meaning you assume all the blurs are uniform within the field. So in real case, the blur are non-uniform because you can go to the camera like uh, with the last two So to uh, deal with this problem, we generalize this observation model to a projection cost model, which is uh, which has more flexibility. So 
let's say the result. This is past image. This is past image from the literature. So on the <coughs> left is our recovery motion kernel pattern. So we visualize on a grid. So from this grid, you can see there is a rotation somehow, and the rotation center is uh, probably on the on the left side, the middle. And on the right is the recovery image from this single blur. This is a comparison with uh, some previous work. This is another comparison. Uh, you can see here we have a less running offset because we are uh, using a very simple optimization form without too much like, empirical uh, technique to make the optimization work. And this is interesting because in the middle, what I show here, what I'm comparing here is a hardware assisted approach, meaning you can you have hardware uh, actually capturing the camera motions, and you want to, with this information, you want to recover. Uh, so here we can show that even without hardware assisted, we can recover uh, this is no high quality. So that is the first uh, generalization. We actually generalized from this uniform motion to non-uniform motion. So here is a, another dimension we want to generalize across the temporal so the temporal um, axis. So from single image, we only got limited information. What if we combine multiple images captured across the time? So typically people do this, or very smartphone they actually use a lucky imaging process, which is you capture a sequence and you pick the best one at the final here we propose a joint resolution approach. Basically, you want to leverage all the information recorded in different other positions, and you want to um, try to restore a single high quality image from all of them. So, in the simplest case, we can uh, present our, our, our idea in the two uh, lines of equation. First is the normal observation model, and second is how we connect from the from the temporal domain. So here we just uh, connected the temporal image the previous from the previous time step to the next step time step with the transmission operator here, which can be a uh, here is only a rigid transformation. <laughs> so on the top here, I actually show three captured uh, consecutive captures from the camera, and on the bottom I'm showing the diverted image. Using this three image as input, and on the bottom actually show the recovered camera motion pattern. The following, I will show some results on the global image. So those are the two blurry images captured with different camera motions. This is one interesting <coughs> result from the later. You can see the comparison. So uh, our results are. So this is a recovery kernel pattern. Actually, we can see the uh, side of the result from the, the kernel, resulting the motion kernel is uh, something that's not, not complete. So basically, some fine detail structures is not recovered in terms of motion. And the, the line in the middle is uh, kind of blurry. It's overestimated. Actually, we can do more than our previous results. We can actually recover a uh, special environment blur pattern go beyond a single so those are the two, another two images. This is, this is one from uh, yeah, this is another one from You can see the, and this is the one, uh, this is the image pair I captured a few more. Uh, this is, on the left I showed one from uh, one of the blurry operations, on the right I showed we actually recovered some information which is really lost in the So this shows this comparison shows actually you if you go in from a single or simplest uh, convolutional model to the uh, more general 
non uniform absorption model, you can change something. Here we can see that the recovery image on the right, which is, has uh, more degree of freedom in the absorption model, you can recover it. So, what I showed just now in a sequence is uh, two blurry images. So, here we can show that we can also work on the two captures with different encoder lengths. Especially, let's see, one blurry image and one noise image, probably captured with a shorter, much shorter lens of exposure. So those are the comparison, comparison. So on the right, on the left, we show our results. Actually, the interesting thing is that we can not only recover the motion kernel for the blurry image, we can also, the second kernel is the uh, estimation on the noise image. We can also get an estimation for that image, which is showing there's really no blur there. Actually, we can uh, go even further by re relaxing the restriction of the two consec consecutive frames. We can go from the global rigid transformation to uh, much more flexible, which is slow. So we can relax the transformation P here to a much more flexible one, which is F, which represents the non parametric group. So we can run that on the video, more general video degree model. So this is one blurry frame. We can actually got the frame before and after this one. Using three frames, we can get something like this. This is blurry part. This is before, this is after. And here we compare, um, in the middle we show the result from uh, Adobe at that time. So this approach is basically find, uh, trying to search before and after for each patch, searching for a sharpest correspondence, uh, and then paste it here. You can see uh, there are some uh, artifacts here because they are pasting patches from different places. So here we are doing a joint open optimization, so we didn't have this kind of aspect, but we recovered also a high quality frame from this very blurry frame. Okay, so this leads to the <coughs> summary of this first part of the tutorial. So what I showed just now is firstly a general formulation, although it's uh, simple, but it's uh, actually give you an opportunity to extend to several different problems. What I illustrated just now is only two simple extensions. One is from the uniform to the non-uniform extension. A single, second is from a single temporal instance to multiple temporal instance. And this uh, formulation has a, only one special um, special property, which is a penalty function. This penalty function has a couple property over the unknown image kernel and the noise level. This is the only difference compared to the previous method. And this couple penalty function gives you an, a progressive sparsity. In the beginning, it only focuses on the large scale structure, so it gives you a better situation in terms of optimization. And as you um, as the recovery goes on, it will adapt its shape, basically introducing more sparsity and focus on more fine detail structure. Uh, if we go beyond restoration, so we can think <coughs> of the idea of connecting low level vision with the high level recognition time, because mostly uh, most previous work may uh, mainly do a restoration first, try to get a high quality image from the low quality observation, and then fit into a pretty existing uh, classifier. So we also try the idea of connecting low level vision with the high level vision in a unified optimization approach. In our previous, like, uh, non deep learning approach, we show that this kind of joint of optimization has some advantages. Um, 
in the second part of the uh, tutorial, we will show that this idea can be uh, exploited further. So that will be the that will be the next part of the tutorial. So here are some uh, relevant references. And that's it. Thanks. All right, so thanks, Kai Chao, for finishing that really efficiently. I think we have uh, enough time to take questions. And uh, if we have more time, I can start earlier. So you actually create some work for me. Is there any question from the audience about the first part of the tutorial? Yeah, yeah please. That's a good question. So, uh, so the simple approach I present just now is an optimization based approach. So I won't say it's fast, but with the kind of idea of deep learning or big networks, we can do we can approximate that optimization with a fast computing approach. We can we can optimize we can approximate the computational process with a let's say recurrent neural network. So that can be some efficient, and that has some like a promising uh, possibility to find more organized additional things. Uh, even for the one that we have, like the internal information model. Yeah, for that kind of uh, estimation. The underlying optimization process is the same. Basically, no matter you're estimating uh, uniform kernel and spatial environment kernel, so the underlying computational uh, amount is actually approximately the same. But I would say it's, it, uh, it's still computational demanding. So, The direction, I think, is to use some network approach to approximate the most of the amount of power. So I'm going to take uh, one question. Uh, I'm personally interested in utilizing structure prior, but I would be curious uh, the, you know, the image domain structure prior that we have been familiar with the fast coding optimization best method, whether they can be generalized well to deep learning context. Uh, you know, uh, we are familiar with that when we do image denoising, image super resolution, we many, you know, graphical, graphics field method heavily rely on properties like multi-scale invariance, like a fractal property. Those properties work well even without relying on data-driven methods. So now, given that we are, you know, we rely really heavily on data-driven in deep learning, how should we incorporate those prior knowledge in deep learning structure design? So, What's our opinion? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So currently, um, uh, this is also related to the first question. So currently, what I saw mostly on the using like a deep learning fashion of image restoration, mostly using a large brute force or kind of brute force end-to-end -end training. So you want to collect a large amount of training pairs, like a blur image, <coughs> sharp image, low resolution image, high so all, all those kind of pairs, and you want to train the network from end to end. In kind of a, it's kind of a, like a prior free fashion. So my view is that if you want to gather much better results, not only from the computational side, but also from the image quality side, you want to leverage or borrow some ideas from the previous optimization approach, like all those kind of image priors. Project prior, structure prior, I incorporate those domain knowledge or expert knowledge into the network design in order to further advance the results or the image quality from the deep learning kind of network. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a very good question. As I mentioned, I mean, in the second 
which they were in, in painting. I have been focused, really focused on each problem separately. So here, uh, what I'm showing just now is mostly on paper, that's for sure. But we will also in the second part of the tutorial. You can see how those uh, different degradation factors come, uh, affect not only the low level variance, but also the high level variance. How can we deal with it? Okay, so this is Okay, let's say I talk again for the first part of the tutorial. Uh, so we're going to move to the second part. The first part is about uh, uh, using um, structure prior to uh, uh, improve the quality of uh, low quality images. Uh, so next, Zhang um, will give you a heavy dose of uh, deep learning based approaches uh, to the same problem. Or, uh, I will this. All right. So thanks, Jebo, and uh, thanks, Hai Chao, for is that her work? And thanks, Hai Chao, for the wonderful first part. And Hai uh, Chao really did a heavy job for me. Well, uh, in terms of both time and uh, things to say, uh, I think uh, we have enough you know, things to discuss in this part. And today I'm going to talk about how to explore the low quality visual data using deep networks. Slightly different from Hachal's part, which is basically talks about image restoration and enhancement. Our focus of this part will be on how to do low level, high level vision tests on low quality data, but by implicitly embedding a low level vision part and jointly optimizing low level and high level for some models. And we were primarily using deep network models and uh, but I personally think that that can be generalized to other world models as well. I will first present a few motivating examples, and then we go through the general methodology supported by a few simulations. And then we go through one by one faulty representative application scenarios, from classifying the low resolution ImageNet dataset to segmenting noisy images to detect objects in the presence of heavy haze, natural haze, and uh, finally. To be finally, uh, the low bit rate of video transmission for the purpose of emotion recognition, which features the interplay of deep learning and video coding. So first things first, let's look at uh, well, the problem motivation. Uh, the high school has uh, greatly introduced uh, low quality data set everywhere that we have to deal with. The most reminding example probably come from the video surveillance. Due to the cost concerns, and the practical demand to install wide-angle camera, we have to deal with low-resolution images, especially when you look at the regions of interest. And the such degradation is really aggregated with noise, with the motion blur of subjects, with the compression artifacts, and some illumination conditions. So basically what we get from a traditional surveillance video is not that usable and low quality by itself. Beyond the zones, so those degradations, like what I just mentioned, low resolution, blur, noise, uh, occlusion, compression, those are relatively familiar, and uh, most of them to be data-independent noise, that often we have ID assumptions. There, but when we come to data collection in the wild, you need to deal with more complicated noises that come from the uncontrolled environment. A typical source comes from the bad weather, and when you collect the data from the outdoor sensors, like you deal with the heavy haze, you deal with rain, you deal with storm and snow. So those examples follow different physical models, but one thing in common, they are the, the degradation that introduced by their data, by those data degradation, are data dependent, non-linear, not ID, and uh, highly complicated. Similar examples can come from those well, not that common imaging conditions like the underworld imaging and recognition, as well as the low illumination conditions when you try to capture video in the night. So that's really another big area that is not as well studied as the general image restoration literature has already done. In addition to those degradations from data acquisition that we have to live with and suffer, one another major source of degradations come from a different way. 
there are certain cases that we want to add degradations to the data by ourselves for some other gains, for some other benefits. So here I will give you two examples. One very well-known example is the probability image and video compression. So you sacrifice the data quality a bit by quantizing the signal in order to better compress or transmit the signal over the low bandwidth channel. Here I give a plot of the adaptive video sampling module, adaptive video non-sampling modular for video transmission over low bitrate bit, bit rate channel. So at the encoder side, the video will be downsampled by an adaptive ratio, which is decided by the channel width. It can be varied. It can be varied, uh, especially in some wireless environment and uh, well in real real transmission scenario. And uh, given those adaptive downsampled videos transmitted to the decoder side, the decoder has to restore the loss caused by the encoder and sometimes also the transmission loss. So this is an adaptive downsampling control recorder and. Uh, we are now, so here, notice that we are actively sacrificing the data quality in order for other good. Another interesting example came from a paper, well, not from my group, but an interesting paper I came across this year. It's by Professor, by Professor McGraw's group in Anna Bloomington publishing Triple AI this year called Privacy Preserving Accurate Recognition from Extreme Low Resolution. They are discussing a very interesting concept. They say, is this possible? to downsample the high resolution video. So you have the high resolution video available. But it is possible to downsample it in a special way to low resolution so that the low resolution video can be reliably done with active rec activity recognition. But face recognition models tend to fail on the same video. And uh, such a degradation transform is learnable. This is not my work. This is his work, but I particularly delighted this concept. That gives you another example how the degradation process can be good in some way. So for resource-wise or for privacy-wise, and there are probably more reasons to account for that. Before we go into any technical details, I will show you a demo video about what we, our proposed methodology in this tutorial can achieve. I will give you some well, background here. The target task in this conversion experiment is to do real-call and uh, real-call and the pedestrian real detection in the heavy images as we video. So I will give you a reminder that all the work, all the models work on a frame by frame basis. So you will observe some temporal consistency, which I suppose should be easily resolved by adding some temporal constraints. And all those video sequences come from the real, you know, the the the, the real traffic monitoring video sequences in Beijing City in hazy weather, in very hazy weather conditions. And the six methods to, to, to be compared here include directly applying a fast RCNN model on the uh, on the hazy video sequences frame by frame. Use three of the state of the art haze removal algorithms to first pre-process the video, do a restoration, followed by apply fast retrain fast RCNN. That's the uh, top of the top middle, top right, and uh, and the bottom to the left, three of them. The fifth one. Is to readapt to do a model adaptation of the of the first RCN over our hazy dataset. The last one is generally our proposed method. So I want you to take a look at the video and see how their results can differ. So as I said, there will be some temporal consistency. It's a frame by frame work. That, so there are bounding boxes and the prediction confidences.
All right, so there are just a few video shots and the original video is downloadable from YouTube. So you can see that, so we are typically picking some, re some relatively heavy haze conditions. And uh, we certainly do not have the original clean scenes without any haze. Uh, so we are just uh, trying to adapt our data model, trend on synthetic data, to be applied on the natural haze images. And it actually prefers quite well, as you can see, from such haze images. That a human can hardly recognize our target coming. It's easy to see that there are two lines. Based on your lack of prior knowledge, you will probably know our target coming. But it, I would say, is a challenge for even a human viewer to mark the bottom box of where the target and whether it's coming. So, this is just an example of what one of the four we will discuss next. And here we'll go to the technical details. The general methodology actually follows quite well by Hytrol's last part. Hytrol correctly point out the okay. So Hytrol correctly point out that low aberration models and high aberration models are often separately researched by two communities in computer vision. So when we really apply them on real system, we will first do a restoration or enhancement, and then do recognition or detection or parsing. That's probably the you know, the the real way to do that is in many, uh, you know, many enterprise applications. And uh, it was not before the age of deep learning that joint optimizing the two will give you good things. And this is a high uh, accessibility best student paper about talking about uh, how to do the joint optimization in a sparse representation perspective. That's actually a quite inspiring paper to our work. So as deep learning prevails, the idea of putting every modulus together into a pepperla and jointly optimizing the pepperla together become even more popular and it's more feasible as well because not every, everything has a, sim, has a simple unified API in the form of neural networks. Just to contain it together and leave other things to gradient descent. That becomes the easiest thing to do. And uh, we are just uh, trying to follow this joint optimization idea and see how far we can go. The first step, so our methodology follows a three-step approach. The first step is to pre-training. So now we, by default, everything we talk here takes the form of neural networks. The first step is to pre-train a low aberration model. Depending on what kind of degradations that you want to work on, it could be a neural network form, denoising, deploring, super resolution, whatever low level model you want to use. One thing I want to emphasize here, here is Probably somebody or someone of you will ask, I'm doing low visual quality recognition. I don't have access to high visual quality data in the same topic. So given that I don't have I, given that I cannot have the high resolution ground truth, how can I train this low level vision and vision part? Our answer is please trust the low level vision model on their good transferability. So I will I will show you in several following experiments that the, given that your objects are natural images and uh, you are trying to train some image restoration model, those models will tend to generalize well. You can train them as use a separate set of high quality images and uh, generate low quality images by your own, given that the generation process can mimic the real degradation. It could be pre it could be as you believe, but it can work well after the model tries to do the generalization. So that's, how, uh, that, that's for the first part. For the first step, there is actually an interesting variance I want to mention here. So uh, I think uh, I think there is just a great question that uh, in practice you don't know the degradation, you don't know even about the specific type of degradation you're going to deal with. So in that case, for well, uh, well, let's make it concrete, let's just say the noise. You you know there's noise, probably you can assume there's ghost noise, but you don't know how well, what is the standard deviation of ghost noise. How should you choose the standard deviation? There is an early paper called uh, Campion 3D Outperform Plan Neural Networks that actually do many empirical experiments and very good results to show that uh, the parameter sensitivity of the standard deviation estimation. And here, we also empirically find that when you have to deal with, so if, you are, if I apply, uh, if I apply, as a, if I train a model using noisy images of standard deviation A, and uh, I'm going to apply this model on noisy images of standard deviation B. In general cases, if A is no less than B, we find the models 
may not perform well for reconstruction purpose, but it can perform really well if we use the reconstructed images for high-level vision tests like recognition. I'm going to show you some results next. So that, that is why we call it aggressive pre-training. So the, the degradation parameters used to train restoration models may not need to perfectly match the actual degradation parameter if your goal is not to do re reconstruction, but to proceed to some high-level vision test. What's the practical implication here? The implication is, as I just said, in practice, you probably cannot know what's the actual noise level. And the noise level, so noise level is just a representative example of all kinds of degradation parameters. And the noise level can be time invariant. So if you want to use a unified model for that, what's the estimate you should use? Our empirical answer is use a reasonable overestimate. That will give you the model, not optimal for restoration, but I will not say optimal, but uh, really good for recognition. Step two is relatively straightforward. So now we have the low-level model that masks a low-quality image to a high-quality image. Now, and we, we often find that instead of the reconstructed images, some intermediate features of the low-level models can be really useful, can be more useful than the reconstructed images when fitting to the high-level vision test. So by default, in our, experience, in our simulation experiment, we will remove the last, the la the last reconstruction layer and uh, you treat all the previous layers of the low-level vision model as a robust feature encoder. So what we want is not the reconstruction, but the feature. Note that and even after the hybrid high quality reconstruction has been removed, this visual extractor still implicitly embeds the low quality, high quality marking relationship. So high quality information is still healthy here. Third step, uh, I guess uh, I guess the third step looks uh, will look uh, more straightforward in a deep learning perspective. So after you got the robust feature encoder in the low level part. Remember that it's pre-trained for a low-level vision purpose, and now it's the feature that is trained for the low-level purpose. Just to concatenate this low-level part with a high-level part, whatever you want. For example, it's a neural network classifier. Now it gives you nothing, nothing other than an end-to-end -end neural network, and you train that from end-to-end. -end. With the initialization of the low-level vision part of, from the low-level vision model we just trained, and for the high-level vision part, you can use a larger learning rate than the low-level vision part. The entire model can be trained, but different from directly training a classification model of this size on low-quality model. Now, the first several layers has been better positioned by a warm initialization from low-level low vision model training. That concludes our basic methodology. I'm sure that those general methodology remind of you may remind of you of many general concepts, quite popular concepts in the context of deep learning. So most the, uh, the most two the two most relevant ones is probably unsupervised pre-training and data augmentation. Unsupervised pre-training was originally introduced in the early stage of deep learning to do initialization with a large amount of unlabeled data. And it's usually followed by unsupervised pre-training, uh, quite uh, popular. Uh, in the early years of deep learning. And uh, the goal is to ease the difficulty of training because we cannot train it. Or as another popular goal is to do transfer learning, just the two tasks and we actually transfer some lower layers. So algorithm size there's some similarity, but for different goals definitely. And for data augmentation, uh, this is another uh, popular concept that is trying to artificially increase the training data volume by creating some label-preserving transformations and adding moderate degradation, uh, such as start start uh, denoid autoencoder, in order to encode the transfer transformation invariance and improve the generalization ability. But uh, we are here. We are trying to generalize those those two conventional concepts and map them with low-level vision task and high-level vision task. So as you can probably guess, the implementation is not really a big deal, is a big deal, but what you can get from this methodology is a big deal. I'm going to show you some simulation experiment before we really proceeding to the real world. 
So the simulation is done on Microsoft uh, Research Asia celebrating faces in the wild face identification test. We are treating their provided original data as a high quality and synthesizing low quality data by ourselves, like some sampling noise, blur, or pollution, and they are mixed. As you can see, we are treating them really tough, and uh, we are. And uh, our goal is to do face record identification from such toughly treated images using our just introduced models. Several methods are compiled. So high, so the high quality model trained and tested on high quality labels as just a baseline. We compare with uh, directly training on low quality recognition model and present on low quality data. We compare, so this is the L3 joint model to uh, represent our proposed method. Uh, and the L2 alpha beta joint denotes the step one replaced with the aggressive training. So alpha and beta here are generally concepts representers of the degradation level, like the noise, standard deviation, like blur kernel size, like the occlusion ratio, and has different meanings, has, has a different meaning in different contexts. But generally, if beta is larger than alpha, that means the degradation represented by beta is heavier than alpha. And we all finally, we compared with a non joint method. That's the typical way. First, to do a restoration and then do a recognition. So I guess we will not go through those numbers one by one, but I will point out to take home point from those numbers. The first thing is if you compare with the joint and the non joint, we have never observed a single case in all our empirical experiments that the joint cannot outperform joint, and the margin is often few. Usually, if you do, uh, and uh, the uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the joint training can further benefit from uh, the aggressive training we just described. For example, here I mean the ground truth, the uh, low quality data is downsampled by four times, and the restoration model is trained on eight times the super resolution So if and uh, we basically found that uh, the aggressive retraining especially helps the low resolution and the blur case. The second take home point is first, uh, do a restoration, then doing a recognition does not necessarily help the recognition if the two are not properly joint optimized. That can be seen by comparing the LQ hyperlight and the LQ non joint hyperlight. Remember that LQ means. Directly try recognition model here on neural network on low quality data and label. LQ non joint means I first train a so for low resolution here, for example, I first train a super resolution model to upscale the low quality data for four times and then train a, a train classification model over the super resolved case. We can see that in the low resolution case and the blur case as well, the non joint method with the help of restoration as a process does not necessarily fit, actually here not, the low quality baseline itself. Thus, uh, this and many other evidences show us none without the joint optimization, restoration is not necessarily helpful, as uh, I think it's also not hard, not that hard to understand. The final uh, remarks of this part, we think that the joint optimization always creates power and it always helps in our practice. Restoration does not necessarily help and can even hurt performance without the joint optimization step. So uh, there are some visualization results here. The first column is the original samples from CSW. The second column is the, the degraded samples. I remember here the noise plus blur. And uh, the third, the third column is a directly reconstruction result by the low level vision model from those degraded images. So you can see that it gets very heavy over over smoothly. Because the image quality by itself is too low. And the, the last column, surprisingly, is the output of the low level vision part after we have joined the trend, low level and high level vision part. So, what's the point here? The point is for the fourth column, the low level vision model has been fed with the high level information, like labels here. And with the high level tuning, although here, although at the high level tuning part, MSE, a mean square error, is no longer a criteria. But visually, we actually get an even better result than in the low level vision training with MSE is a criteria. And uh, of course, the identifiability of these faces are also better as evidenced by the numbers in the uh, first two pages. So, why that could happen? Remember, it is because the fourth column image takes more information than the third column image. Third column image. And such extra information come from the high level vision test. 
OK, so that's the methodology part. And then now we are seeing one by one how it can generalize to more complicated models and more complicated tasks. The first task, uh, first task, we are trying to scale up what we have just done on ImageNet dataset and uh, creating some low-resolution versions of ImageNet. Uh, we were using the super-resolution computation on ImageNet network proposed in ECCV 2014 uh, as a low-level model. We were using the VTT16 model as a high-level model, so we are not uh, playing with simple models anymore. We are, we are using real models on real sets. And, uh, the, for, and for the data set, we emphasize here the low level pre training rely on no access to high resolution image net, original resolution image net. We are using the classical 91 image training set for super resolution. And uh, we are creating low resolution chaos by ourselves with the different down sampling ratio of S, S equals 2, 4, and 8. For the, joint, for the tuning and testing state, we are playing with the training set and validation set of image net of 2012. They are also some samples for S time, and we are doing single scale testing using VGD16. So, no, so, so over, overall, the process we do not assume we have access to high resolution internet data. And here are some results. Here are the results. Actually, the result, uh, I'm not sure if you can view that. So, the, the left finger is top one, right finger is top five. There are several things we can consider think from those fingers. So if you look at the applying on three, so the x-axis is the downsampling ratio x. We sample the two, four, and eight. The point one means that the original image net has performance. So the first thing we can see that if you directly apply a model trend on high resolution to low resolution model, how much degradation you will suffer? So if so that means that so that gives us the impression it's not wise. To directly apply what you get on high quality, low quality, low quality back to a different world. The second story to take back home. If you look at the, the green line, that means first apply super resolution CNN, then followed by VGG, and uh, do not join the tunes on each other, just use SRCN as a purpose. It actually does not improve much. And uh, I wonder if it improves the S equal A. The two good performance here is. Uh, the red line is retrain VGG, means we do a model adaptation of the VGG model on the low quality data. And finally, the light blue line is, uh, is the model trend using our proposed methodology before. So the margin is not that heavy, because uh, it's not, 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 not that large. But uh, we, so actually this is, uh, um, this is still an ongoing result. We suspect that it's because of due to some optimization difficulties. So we are still are working on um, enlarge this market. But even so far result, we can see that the, 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 the margin is the margin persists and uh, is actually visible as the resolution goes low. Another, another natural question that I know may arise from the audience. It is just because we are using more parameters in this model. Just the two, SRCN, SRCN. If you jointly train them together, layers neural network, and isn't it natural for a two network by such a margin? That's a very good question. Experiment architecture in front of VGG. The only And we also pre trained that. The only difference is pre trained on low quality data to reconstruct themselves quality relationship in the first uh, SRCM part. Uh, I didn't get catch to draw it here. Where we some it cannot be on par with either we trained or the Four results and the numbers and will be reported in our coming manuscript and we'll see result a bit better than its current shape. The last stage. So I think is recognition together. Recognition. Because oh, the super resolution. We are trying to create a MSE 
are trying to create some, well, perceptually, visually, there's no guarantee at all, and I don't think that's possible for super resolution to create the true details. It's just the hallucinated details. So, and uh, why super, super recognition? So I think the answer is broken into two parts. Super resolution may be helpful. That means uh, the super resolution hallucinated details can have details that may otherwise be open models, some of which will benefit record. For this part, for empirical evidence of this claim, Low One Coos group publishing WCV 2016 solution for other vision tasks, it actually pro. Well, at that time, was still working on that. Answer: Yes, super resolution. First part, I use the hallucinated details from super resolution. It can be evidenced by our previous result that can sometimes even fail to a model. Restore, that means adding a restoration as a preprocessing something that the joint tuning step actually provide high level task and provide a feature refinement. As in High Charles paper, are well recovered in that's the that that's that's the philosophy behind. Okay, so the, the so the I will not go very much. So this is this work is done by my colleague, and work and uh, then train a segmentation network. Quite a you know quite a re, re, resemble. apply a joint loss. That means when they try the MSE loss we used in the reconstruction lab as a hybrid loss between low level and high level loss. And uh, is it better than what we just about considering the loss? Really, it depends. And I will show you what that denoting network follows the UNet, and uh, you may want to just show one result here. So the one example is a noisy. It's a it's a noisy. BGG based security. And the second image is the the. the Came from the segmentation result of standard deviation 30. So it's a relative denoising network to denoise and then do. So noise actually, noise. The artifact introduced by denoising also affects without joint optimization. The third column is the single loss in the super resolution case. So you are first and optimizing entire pipeline on the segmentation loss level part. So you can see the segmentation, the segmentation actually misclassed, the mislabeled pixel. But if you pay some attention to the in the above, you can see that the denoise that we were there because we do not even optimize the denoise in the optimizing the hybrid loss between the low level and visible loss and the better with the 
application smoothening. From those numbers, the second, so we, so, and uh, the detection and, 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 and the segmentation loss. If we segmentation, your PSNR is actually best because your if you're using only high-level loss, you get the best restoration loss suffers. If you're doing joint, the better, best performance on either of the criteria, get a reasonably good result on both of them. So uh, just the next to the separate method, but it's much better than the same method. So if you only care about the high-level performance, just use a single loss. If you really segmentation, use a hybrid loss. The video I just this tutorial. So this is takes the hazy images as input. Quite lightweight. Uh, uh, we claim it as the first clean image from a hazy image without any intermediate. That may look a little bit weird to many people. The restoration, because in super resolution denoising and deblurring, people has been the end-to-end -end idea for years. The Data dependent noise. So they are actually the separate uh, for the artifact created by Hayes from, a clean, from all clean Hayes images, follow some physical models and requires your after training. So basically, we did that in. Published, we have to show good PSNR, SSM, visual quality. The main point is since now we have the real end, same thing, just like we did before. I think uh, I don't need to repeat that, it's just a similar. When you retrain, we are all. Uh, but finally, our uh, joint optimization we compare the the pre-trained fast asynchronous detection model A denote LD net, which is uh, the three the three columns in the middle denote uh, that for using four state of the art decay followed by the detector uh, pre-trained first to retrain do a, uh, by a domain adaptation of the problem is the joint training method. So jointly auto and uh, actually with a quite good margin method. And again we have verified it's not placing an auto encoder in front of them. So some this is uh, image, single image examples. First columns, directly applying first fast RCN on hazy images. Second, uh, second and third column, two previous deep pre-processing. So note that they are not uh, directly. Instead, they are trying to estimate the haze degradation parameter from a physical formula to calculate the clean image out. And so these two, uh, those, these two results, and uh, to append our proposed model. So it, it's just use them as a pre, use it as a preparation over the hazy images. Last column. 
in boxes and the, conf uh, and the confidence pr prediction. Conf you can see that uh, actually for dehazing algorithms, the reason ones, it's already not that in their visual quality. And uh, I, it tend to be all illumination differences, some color tone differences. So But we think that after comparing, we have a better and more objective sense. You can see that we can detect even the, we detect all the human visible while not for any other method. And we in the by work, and uh, we also produce reliable bounding boxes in among all the methods. A tenable result uh, in up to our best knowledge. With the video coding people and uh, for emotion recognition face images at the encoder and transmit decoding it at the decoder side and to output is represented by a continuous value so the object regression and uh, what we because we are working with some medical people doing to create an embedded device that can maybe a phone and a mobile phone can detect how well your today's facial expressions and we are doing the which the main thing we propose here is it's not necessarily to compress The, the video will be used for. Instead, uh, trying to preserve the preserve the future purpose of emotion recognition by training us. Tra he always basically look like this. This is a and uh, we are down sampling that from three times. Motion, facial, actually, uh, emotion record. Those images. I like to make a note here uh, that improve the performance. Of eight. We cannot do the last two. It's too difficult. But up to. And, uh, and uh, that 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 is. Emotion recognition modular as you I, I, as you. Is with slightly different uh, uh, the network target now. But here the evaluation we used uh, before that uh, there is uh, so before, so far we are trying. It's an interesting empirical thing that we discovered uh, in. Unique challenge in this scheme because in the encoder bandwidth of this channel, it encoder has rate it can be varied. It's not just like we are doing with uh, the decoder knowledge, decoder side without without the so will change have to be robust to our. It is possible to try an example of models to do well. So we develop a, a, a take home point here is for in order to robust this low resolution emotion recognition. 
factors, you have to treat low level vision vision part with the ma so, so suppose that you have a range of downsampling factors that you know, like uh, here from 3 to 16. From the low level vision part, we are going to pre train the super resolution using the maximum downsampling. That probably reminds you of the aggressive pre as a feature encoder pre training low level vision model. Part by such aggressive training strategies. And when joint tuning the data for recognition, we use low quality data generated by the full range of degrade, uh, degradation equals 3 to S equals 16. That's, that's remissive of the data augmentation, the scaling where you models. It's just, a, uh, it, in fact, Augmentation. So by a combination of aggressive augmenting classic, the high level recognition mixed training strategy, which we find the downside better than we expected. That's just a one model. Put inside the evaluations, so the x axis. That is an evaluation of the transmission is the two criterion used to match two different kinds of uh, correlation coefficient. We two criterions, and uh, we we. And then do emotion recognition without the joint of optimization. So each specific degradation factor S and joint one for all model trend using max mix gradation. Two examples as S equals uh, S equals. The better rate distortion trade trade off. We there we all want the curve to be placed as high as possible. Uh, you can see that the pink curve, which means the joint, better rate distortion, and it even outperforms the dedicatedly. Joint dedicated trend for S equals four model, which is if we do not jointly train the restoration to the blue line, the non-joint four, which no longer surprisingly placed the lower and directly wrong model on low resolution model, and and many more fingers are included in the, in the paper. So achieves a good result in video coding and transmission. And we are now generalizing it to more task scenarios. Only a few references if you're interested. The general to include because main reason is we are try, still trying to. So I guess uh, we are we all finish that paper finish that paper. And, but if you are interested in the manuscript or other materials, just feel free to send them. The papers has been publicly available. So for super CV papers, just my CVPR 2016. My co-author, but check my collaborator Dean's paper. An object detection, check my Menti Boy's paper on Accepted ICCV and uh, I extended, which will include more. So, ICCV paper is more on the. This will be more than. There's a super resolution and video communication. Please check our paper in S. For emotional recognition, there are some more video coding. 
I would like to dedicate the last page to all the people. My colleagues, Dean, my mentee, Bowen, and uh, our work. Uh, we give we give we give many thanks to industrial uh, in, industrial collaborators, uh, Jian Chao and Shi Yu from uh, several major companies in Silicon. Coding and compression project, uh, it is based on collaboration. And for the dehazing and objective detection, it's a uh, attributed to intern Bo Yili, researchers Xiu Lian. I talk today. Young professors. It was too early. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I, we have plenty. I think it's jokes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, you, you. Okay, go All ahead. Right. Uh, yeah, we will have a break. Actually, this is a very stupid question, so <laughs> I didn't want to come out <laughs> here. So <clears throat> I didn't understand what the joint means. Is that you just add the Add the uh, errors from uh, from VGG and the super super resolution. Oh, so you are resolution. talking about the noise. segment segment noisy yeah. image segmentation. Okay, so uh, in the segmentation experiment, uh, Dean is actually using a hybrid loss. So uh, the main difference between our mainstream work is uh, we are in our most of our work we will remove the low level like or loss like MSE or SSIM after we have trained the low level and just keeps the feature encoding part. And in Dean's in Dean's work, he will keep that and use a weighted combination of the low level and the high level task task. So in the final retrain, in the final stage tuning, we are just uh, we are optim we are minimizing a weighted combination of soft max not soft, uh, of segmentation loss and the reconstruction loss uh, well with the wish to preserve some good low level low level property so I, uh, and as I said if that can be adopt, adopted if you really want to keep some low level good things Uh, merge them together and uh, join to optimizing the two yes. parts. Yes. Uh, so if I understand your, uh, your question correct, you're asking that since deep learning is do the real end-to-end -end learning, why we still need to use a high quality information supervision in the low level model part? Okay, very good question. Uh, I think uh, I will not say that we are doing feature crafting or engineering. Instead, let's say we are just trying to inject more information in training this network. What will happen if we just train a network from low quality to, lab to labels? That's all the information you have. And, but if you use high, low quality, high quality pairs to pre-train the low level vision part, you actually get uh, extra information. So, and uh, that's for the, if, you, if we do not have access to the high quality data of your target data set, we are actually relying on the transferability of the general models. And as I show in the comparison experiment, using the same architecture, given different way it is trained or say it is initialized, it actually gives that is because you are fitting different things. Like when I encode with nothing but low quality data. If I try 
as the actual information. So now it's become SRCNN. Simplest way to use external knowledge. Prior knowledge is the transferability. Is more intuitive. I have a question. Yeah. Have you image degradation? I think people will uh, still coming, but let's get started on time. Uh, so in the first two parts of this tutorial, we have covered topics on how to deal with uh, low quality viral data in terms of human perception, which is image restoration, and also second part to machine recognition, which is how to train jointly uh, low level and high level parts together. So in this third part, uh, we're glad to have Professor uh, further extend our scope of this tutorial to uh, the task of how to deal with uh, low quality uh, labels, which is like uh, such as weak, noisy uh, labels, which is frequently encountered in computer vision and uh, machine learning uh, fields. So uh, a brief introduction, Professor Luo is a full professor at uh, Department of Computer Science, University of Rochester. He's a well-known researcher in uh, computer vision, multimedia, and big data analytics. Uh, he's a, a fellow of IEEE, IEPR, and uh, SPIE. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, join me in welcoming Professor Luo to give his talk. Thank you, Hai Chao, for the uh, introduction. Uh, first, I want to commend Hai Chao and uh, Zhang Yang for, for, for their excellent job uh, in the first two parts of uh, this tutorial, uh, which deal with um, low quality images. Uh, so as he already mentioned, I'm gonna focus more on low quality labels. Um, uh, th this uh, subtitle is a little bit uh, misleading. Uh, it's not just the noisy labels. Sometimes we don't have many labels. We ha sometimes have noisy labels. Uh, in any event, we don't have high quality labels. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see uh, if we can still do some uh, effective machine learning. <coughs> uh, so machine learning or artificial intelligence is, is very hard these days. Uh, I don't need to spend too much time on telling everyone um, um, how hard everything is right now. Um, and you, you've heard this news um, I think we, we are hearing news every week that some machine learning systems are beating humans. Okay. Uh, that, uh, what I want to say is that there's, there's some truth in there, but there's also a lot of hype. Um, and uh, uh, these two are just two examples of, uh, uh, of uh, um, good computer vision systems that actually beat human. But I want to... Uh, add a caveat that uh, in either case, um, such performance was achieved on uh, a standard testing data set, um, which is great. But it doesn't mean that you can take this system 
and then run on any real world data and get the same performance. Okay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we, we are seeing a lot of progress today. Uh, so what are the factors that uh, propelled this, these advances? I think uh, I, I have a few here. The first one is sensor technologies. Uh, we just have you know, uh, so many imaging devices like your cell phone. Uh, we can get all kinds of images. Uh, if you uh, talk to some old timers like Terry Bolt who was here, uh, a minute ago, um, um, in old days when we work on image processing, we only had one image. Okay, it, do you know which image that is? It's called the Nana. Okay, that's the one image that image processing people played years and years. But today we can get millions, even billions of images. So uh, big data certainly made a difference, uh, especially with deep learning. Uh, uh, systems. Uh, and another reason is computing power. So without GPU and other powerful um, computing uh, resources, we wouldn't be able to do the kind of thing we, we can do today. Uh, but one thing that's frequently or conveniently forgotten uh, in all such hype is the amount of human power that's needed to allow or enable today's uh, Machine, uh, machine learning systems. Um, I think um, this couple of uh, weeks, uh, there, this uh, article, which was uh, you know uh, much talked about uh, in, in, in the com vision community as well as outside the vision community, it's called uh, the unreasonable, uh, unreasonable effectiveness of more data. Okay, uh, basically, um, I think. Uh, that, that, that picture was Jeff Dean uh, of Google. Basically, he was telling the audience that uh, two things. Um, while the uh, um, model size and the computing power um, have been going up, right, uh, the, the size of the database hasn't been. So, uh, and then Google and their collaborators basically did some uh, experiment to show that if you keep increasing the size of the data set, your system gets better and better, there, and there seems to be no li limit. Okay, um, I, I think this <laughs> has to be taken with a, a grain of salt. Okay, um, I'm not going to argue that you can't uh, achieve increasingly better uh, performance with machine uh, with, with more data, but one thing has to be said, which is the human labor. The amount of human labor in AI, okay. Uh, AI stands for artificial intelligence, but the first two words, artificial intelligence in Chinese, are four words. And the first two words in English means artificial, but if you only look at the two words, it also means human labor, okay. Uh, so peop some people were joking that um, <coughs> Uh, the amount of human labor you put in your system will determine how intelligent your system will be. So why is that? Uh, um, one thing <coughs> uh, that, that becomes so impressive to me uh, during my tour of uh, China last month was uh, these major uh, companies in China, um, <coughs> uh, they can hire hundreds of uh, data annotators Basically, they said they are doing nothing but labeling data. Okay, that's the kind of human power that uh, that's actually unimaginable to me. Okay, we are we're in the university. Okay, we can't afford to hire fifty or hundred data labelers to do the job. Okay, but what they do? Okay, these people they either draw bounding boxes or put labels. Uh, some do even more elaborative things like drawing eyes, nose, and mouth, hands, everything. Okay, um, it's really uh, <coughs> it's really <laughs> not glorious work, and it has to be uh, recognized uh, in this grand scheme of you know more data, uh, better performance. Uh, it, it came with a human cost. Okay. <coughs> And uh, before we know, we do this sort of thing, you know, through Amazon Mechanic Turk. Um, and but today, I think, um, like I have it here. Now, it, now, now data labeling 
has become an industry, um, um, <laughs> which is certainly beyond my imagination. Okay. Uh, but in the meantime, not everyone can afford uh, hiring so many people to do the data labeling. Okay, so um, um, I think we are among a group of people that uh, <clears throat> who have to do something else. Okay, uh, so what what uh, um, did we have to do? Uh, we decided okay, we can't hire so many people to label the data for us, uh, but perhaps we can borrow data from somewhere. Okay. And where do we borrow the data? We borrow data from the web, okay? So uh, these days you may have heard this phrase called Webly Supervised Learning, okay? Uh, what's Webly Supervised Learning? Basically you are using data from the web, okay? Um, but uh, one thing that's, um, that you have to be aware of the web data is uh, unlike this data that you pay someone to to, to label um, the data from the web is noisy, okay? Uh, because these are these are in images uh, with user-generated tags or labels, okay? These users they generated these labels and tags for some other reasons. They didn't do it to enable machine learning, okay? That's for sure, okay? So uh, that means um, in order to make good use of such data, <coughs> we have to be very careful, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a few examples using our own work uh, to illustrate the sort of difficulties and issues uh, that we have to um, address when we use uh, data borrowed from the web, okay? Um, so we actually, started this line of work um, a while ago, okay? Mm. For example, in this CVPR 2009 paper, uh, I think we, we built the first uh, um, video data set in the wild, okay? Um, we started with 11 classes from YouTube. Uh, I think we, we actually ended up spending a few months just doing the data collection. Um, the reason was um, on YouTube, if you search videos by keywords like the action type, this is for action recognition, and you end up with lots of videos, but some of the videos uh, were irrelevant, okay? They just happened to have the tag, okay, for whatever reason, okay? And some videos were, irre were relevant, but only for parts of each video. So my student had to you know, go into the video, trim the unnecessary part, and keep the part that's really useful. Okay, so that's a lot of work, uh, but that's the beginning, okay? So my collaborator, Mubarak Shah, has carried on that work and extended this data set to UCF 101, which is, uh, is now a very popular data set for action recognition. Uh, and uh, back in 2009, when we were doing this, when we published this paper, we were really happy to be able to push the accuracy to about 70% for 11 classes. Uh, but last month, uh, when I checked with some folks, they said they could do 95% on 101 classes, okay? So um, that tells me two things. One, uh, deep learning really made a difference. Two, if you have a, a public data set, sooner or later, someone's gonna reach 99%, okay? Um, but anyway, okay, so this was, uh, was 2009. So, we, um, and then we followed that work by another paper um, published in 2010. Um, the idea was precisely to address this late, uh, data labeling issue, okay? Because uh, labeling image is a lot easier than labeling videos, okay? You can label image like by just clicking on images. But the video, you have to watch go through each video to make sure that it indeed contains the uh, type of uh, concept actions that you are looking for. Uh, so in this 2010 paper, what we did was really was the beginning of uh, this webly supervised learning. So as the title indicates, so we, we, we went to the web to get more um, labeled uh, video samples. 
So what we effectively did was, so we have some video action or video event classes, and we um, manually labeled some good examples, let's say 10 per class. Then uh, we figure we don't want to do that anymore. So we're going to go to YouTube and say we get a thousand examples of a certain class, like sports or picnic. Okay? Uh, but the issue is we're not sure whether those 1,000 additional YouTube videos are actually good examples, right? Uh, so uh, back then, we formulated this problem as a cross-domain um, learning problem, okay? Uh, so what we did was, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> we have two domains. One domain is whatever the domain we are working on, okay? We want to figure out what types of video um, we are looking at. Uh, the other domain is uh, we go to YouTube, okay? <clears throat> and then we, we use uh, keyword search to find similar videos. Okay, so um, <clears throat> for example, sports, like you can have your kids' baseball game, but you can have professional uh, baseball game videos. Uh, so the idea is how do we do some kind of transfer learning in order to um, transfer the knowledge that we learn from the YouTube domain to whatever domain, which we call personal video domain, okay? Uh, and that's the, uh, um, that's the problem we, we, we try to solve, okay? Uh, so, um, um, <clears throat> yeah, these were my collaborators. Um, so I go, go through this paper a little bit because that gives you some idea of, uh, um, you know, how we address this learning from web data problem. <clears throat> Uh, the first problem we actually had to address was how do we even measure the similarity between videos, right? You have two videos. Um, you know, any classification problem is a similarity measure problem, okay? So, um, so we figured out a particular way called aligned space-time uh, uh, space pyramid matching. So that's the first issue we had to resolve, how to measure the similarity between videos. And the second issue we, we had to resolve was uh, how do we um, uh, address this cross-domain differences between two sources of data. Uh, and we designed a so-called adaptive multiple kernel learning scheme to, to do that. Okay. So this was pre-deep learning. Okay. Uh, so conceivably, one could rethink about this whole issue and try to resolve it, um, re revisit it. Um, using deep learning techniques, but I think what's more important is this, the, 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 the concept or the framework, not necessarily the exact machine learning me methods, okay? Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't have to explain too much about the kind of problem we try to address. So we want to, you know, search in personal videos your own, okay? And you know, weddings, sports, picnic, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and um, for people who work in uh, this type of problem, okay, or any vision problem, we already know, right? Uh, we have to deal with large intra-class variability, and uh, but the, the issue that we have to address here is, what if we only have very limited number of labeled videos? Okay. Uh, so. <coughs> So the idea back then was to borrow videos, a large number of them from the web, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, um, so we have two domains. We have so-called consumer domain, okay? That was the terminology we used at the time, okay? Uh, and then we have YouTube domain, okay? <clears throat> so in order to um, measure the similarity between two videos, um, People have tried different means. For example, they, in order to sort of have some variability in time, they, you can cut each video into two parts. And then you can uh, accommodate some spatial variability by um, splitting each frame into four quarters. Okay? And then you can do both at the same time. Uh, people tried all of that. Okay? Um, but the issue uh, it was um, that's still not enough. Okay, so uh, what we came up with was uh, it's not advancing. Okay, was th was this um, 
scheme. Okay. So, um, so we partition each video into eight uh, subcubes. Okay. So now we have to measure the similarity between these little cubes. Um, if we don't pay too much attention, we can say, okay, in video one, with video I and video J, and we just need to check the differences between uh, the corresponding cubes. Um, and uh, we, we use something called uh, inter, interflow earth movers distance. It's basically a, a metric, okay? Um, but I think in, in this paper, we, we did something that's a little bit more robust. That is, we allow the correspondence to vary, to move around. It's essentially, we don't have to say, like this corner, oh, you can't see it, okay? So, but you, can, you, can, you get the idea. So the, the red block can match to another red block in a different uh, location in space and time, okay? So, uh, for example, we can allow that to be a match. So it, it becomes like a cubic matching problem, okay? So um, <clears throat> that is our way to allow that um, some spatial temporal variabilities between two videos. Uh, so this is an actual example to show the how we match to baseball videos such that, um, you know, a baseball, a ba each baseball game is a little bit different. So a baseball, a home run can happen anywhere. Can happen in the beginning, can happen in the end. That's why we need to shuffle the time. We, we, we need to allow the uh, different parts to move around in time, okay? Also, the, the, the view uh, can be different. So we need to allow the space, uh, the spatial position to, to mix and match. Okay, so this is the illustration with the color code. Uh, so, okay, that's the first part. Okay, the second part is the, actually the learning part where we have to address the uh, um, domain mismatch. Okay, and we were using uh, this so called MMD. Okay, um, I'm just going to highlight a few main concepts in the paper. The paper itself uh, can be, can take some time to read. Okay. Um, but okay, so we use MMD to measure the cross domain, uh, the, 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 the mismatch between uh, two distributions. Then we, we did a bunch of things. For example, we can pre train a bunch of classifiers in both the source domain and the target domain, and then we can make linear combinations of them. <laughs> okay, and uh, <coughs> this is the, uh, it's not coming up yet. Okay, this is the, 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 the target decision function. So I won't bore you with the, all the equations, okay? But this is the idea. So the first part with the summation, basically we're trying to combine a bunch of pre-learned classifiers. We can consider that the prior information. And the second part with the delta F, uh, we, we call it the perturbation function. Okay, that's, that's sort of the bridge between the two domains, okay? Uh, so this whole thing is kind of really com complicated, uh, which I will skip, okay? And we did some other things to make sure that we minimize the uh, overfitting due to, you know, too many parameters. <coughs> uh, and then we compare with other cross-domain um, uh, learning techniques that at that time, okay? So uh, there, there's, there are these domain transfer SVM, adaptive SVM, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so a little bit about our data set. So you can see that we constructed a very challenging situation. So we, we had uh, about 200 uh, videos. Right? And then we, 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 we collected about 900 videos, web videos. Okay, so these numbers are smaller by today's standards, but it was good enough then, okay? And then uh, we, uh, what we did that was so extreme is we have two videos per event. So those are the only strong labels we have. Then we have um, um, many other, uh, over 100 uh, web videos. Okay, so that means you, we have very few uh, label data that we, are conf uh, we have confidence in. And a lot of uh, samples we don't have confidence in. Okay, uh, so that's again the details. Uh, but we were able to show that in the end, uh, first of all, this 
mix and match shuffling scheme uh, does give us more ability to handle you know, the variabilities in the video. Okay? And then the other conclusion was, let me speed this up, was that um, regardless of what type of features we use, whether we use uh, SIFT features or spatial temporal features or both type of features, uh, if we use this cross-domain learning scheme that's based on adaptive multiple kernel learning, we, we achieved better results. Okay? Uh, so, so that was the early work, which I want to mention. Okay. <clears throat> uh, more recently, uh, we, we worked on another problem, um, which is image sentiment. Uh, this is a newer problem, um, much newer than you know, ImageNet and other things. And it's also of ab uh, abstract nature. Uh, so the idea is, given any image, can we tell what sentiment this image would uh, invoke in, um, in a person, okay? Uh, so this work, uh, the earliest work of this nature was uh, 2010. Uh, back then, uh, the people can only use some features like this color sift features. Then they use the linear SVM to be the classifier. Uh, and they were able to find that, oh, okay, so those color, colors correspond to positive sentiment Essentially, they are warm colors, and then there are these cold colors that are associated with uh, negative sentiments, uh, and then other patterns they found. Uh, actually, these patterns are not that meaningful, because in the end, when they reported the, the accuracy, it was 51% for a binary problem. So essentially, nothing really was learned, okay? Uh, so we did something different. We decided, we, okay, this was all pre-deep learning. So we decided we're going to use visual attributes as the feature instead of the low-level features. For example, if we can extract some um, mid-level visual attributes like these words, then based on these words, we can train classifiers to convert these words to sentiments. So it turns out to be more successful and we, ach we achieved the accuracy of 61%. Okay, that would lead, to, lead me to the next, uh, next paper I want to highlight, which deals with uh, learning using uh, pseudo labels. Okay, uh, so, <coughs> so now this was already 2012 ish. Uh, we already knew that. Um, you know, annex lab did great on uh, ImageNet. So we thought we should do deep learning on, for, for, for image sentiment, okay? But then the question is, where do we get the label data, right? So um, even though we only have two uh, kinds of sentiment, positive or negative, but intuitively you would know that the types of images that can cause positive sentiment are limitless, okay? So this is unlike any uh, object recognition problem where you, okay, like, let's get 10,000 examples of a bottle or uh, 100 uh, million examples of a face. We can train good classifiers. Um, so we figure we, we at least need a million images labeled, okay, to train deep networks for image sentiment. But um, we calculate the cost, it's actually more than what we could afford in a university, okay? Uh, so now we were stuck. So we want to do deep learning for image sentiment, but we couldn't afford to have one million images labeled. So we had to be creative. So the creative thing we did was, we, we, since we already have a 61% classifier, we use this classifier to machine label a million images. Uh, so then we have a, a million images labeled, right? So you say, oh, great, great. Let's do deep learning with this million images. Except that you have to be aware that, okay, these labels are not reliable, right? Since it's labeled by a 61% classifier, so every three samples it labeled, one of them uh, must be wrong. And you don't know which one is wrong, okay? So, but we didn't have a choice. So we say, okay, let, let's do it, okay? So we give it to a deep learning network like AnySnet, and we train it. It turns out, hey, actually, this 
network actually learn something. So on an independent test data set, it actually achieved uh, 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 an accuracy of 71%. So this is encouraging. So we decided, OK, let's take this 71% classifier and label another million images. Then this time, I expect the quality of the labels to be better. Not only that, I could possibly try to have a way to eliminate some unreliable labels and keep the more reliable labels. Okay, how do I do that? Okay, so one thing we did is we look at the confidence of the network, right? Um, in the ideal situation, if your network was trained uh, with sufficiently sufficient number of strong labels, then this confidence value is useful. But we didn't have that, okay? So we cannot use the confidence value as the threshold to determine which samples to keep, which samples to, to, to throw away. But at least we can use this as a rough measure to sample the, um, the labels and decide which ones to keep. And this is the curve we use to uh, we sample the, 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 the data set, OK? Uh, so uh, we call this thing progressive CNN, OK? And we did it a few rounds. Uh, and in the end, we were able to achieve 78% on, on, again, on an independent test data set. So that was uh, quite encouraging. Um, and uh, uh, we also look at the results of these images, uh, basically, uh, those are the left half is uh, they are all um, supposedly positive sentiment images. These are negative sentiment images. Each row is uh, these are top five ranked images by each method. Each column is a method. Uh, so these methods, these five or these four, are based on low level features, which we know they don't do much. They are they have fifty one percent accuracy. And then uh, these two, um, they are <coughs> some version of the 61% classifier. So even in the top five, they make some errors. And then in the first two columns in each half uh, represent uh, the results by deep learning. Uh, the, the first one being the progressively trained classifier. So um, you can see that the results are, are quite good. Okay. Um, and I want to mention uh, another data set we created for, for this, um, for, for an extended problem. Basically, image sentiment is binary, positive or negative. But we, we, we have many, many more emotions. In fact, psychology says we have 24 emotions. Uh, but in fact, there are eight primary emotions, and each one has three levels. So that's three levels of arousal and eight types of valence, so that's 24. Uh, but there was no good data set for, at least not, no good data, data set for large enough for deep learning. Uh, so then we had to do our own work. Uh, and again, we, we, we couldn't afford to do it entirely by human. So what we did is we, we used text information to go to this professional data set database called Getty Images. And then we use the text description to pre-select uh, enough images for each type of emotion. And then we use Amazon Mechanical Turk to verify whether a particular image indeed has um, the emotion among at least the five Turkers. So in the end, we were able to create a data set that um, even for the smallest, data, uh, for smallest class, I, I think it's fear or something, uh, we have at least a thousand images, and then we use the previously described uh, progressive thing. And to do the training, we were able to get to a fifty-nine percent, a fifty-eight percent. This data set hasn't been tried by many researchers, so I want to encourage people to try it uh, because it's very much worth trying. It's sort of in the sweet spot because if a data set People already got to 98%. I think I don't think you want to join because you know most of the gains have been achieved. Uh, but if the data set is currently at 28%, you don't want to join either. That means we are so far away from solving the problem. Okay, and we have this 58%. 
that's a sweet spot. I think everyone should jump in, work on this data set, okay? Um, but my, I'll give you a warning, it's actually very hard to crack this data set. This is unlike ImageNet or anything like that, okay? <clears throat> All right, so um, the, in the final part of this uh, talk, I want to uh, go over a uh, paper that we just got in uh, ICCV, uh, which is about uh, learning from noisy labels with distillation. Distillation, okay. <clears throat> uh, so um, basically, if you look at the, all the things we could try, the spectrum of techniques we could try uh, when we deal with noisy labels, uh, we can do supervised learning, which incurs high, highest cost, right? We can do un completely unsupervised learning, which, um, you know, there are many issues, okay? And there's supervised learning um, in between. Uh, but learning from noisy labels is, you know, a, a, a viable thing to try, okay? Uh, so uh, we did it on this huge data set called YFCC 100 million, okay? Um, <clears throat> so um, basically, um, how come I'm not looking at the same <laughs> slides? Okay, so uh, basically, um, we could uh, um, get some samples. I need to plug in the power. <coughs> Before it dies. Okay, so, um, So, so what we did was we, we take a subset of, from this data set and then we make sure we have enough clean labels, okay? Then we try to make use of the uh, noisy labels, okay? So that's the idea. And then uh, let me give you an example of the type of label, label noise, okay? So we're looking at a particular type of bird called willard, okay? Um, so typically, so in these days, some people are working on this problem, you know, learning with noisy labels. But um, many people make the simple assumption that the label noise is random. In other words, uh, when the label is wrong, it could be anything, right? For example, this could be, you know, cat or dog. But in reality, that's not going to happen, especially with images from the web. When you have noise in the labels, the noise is usually uh, caused by ambiguity in text. Okay, for example, this, um, this wallet can be a person's name. Okay, so whichever image is labeled with the person's name, obviously those images are incorrectly labeled for my problem of trying to find the bird. Okay, uh, so that's the type of noise we have to deal with and it's not random, okay. Uh, so, <coughs> Let me first review um, a few representative methods in dealing with noisy labels, okay? Uh, so the first one uh, is called bootstrap. Um, there's a reference for that. But basically the idea is you're gonna do your best uh, with, the, um, with your current model and then you update the modified labels, okay? This is very similar to what I just described for image sentiment. Uh, classification, okay? <coughs> uh, basically, there's no guarantee this would work. Uh, there's only hope that it would work, that your model can handle the noise that's in the label, okay? <coughs> and then the next method is called reweight. Again, I give you the, 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 uh, the recent reference. Um, it basically, what, what you do here is you estimate the noise, okay? With, with a pre-trained classifier, okay? And then you estimate the probability or likelihood of a particular sample being a noisy sample. Then you uh, train the model with the, um, with the noisy sample, you know, with the loss multiplied by the, uh, by the weight, okay? So that's a way to uh, uh, incorporate the noise. Um, the third way of dealing with noisy label is uh, called a noisy layer, 
basically you add an extra layer to your current network uh, in the hope that this layer will absorb the noise. Okay, so below the layer, everything should be perfect. Okay, <clears throat> and then you 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 do your optimization, hoping uh, everything would work out. Okay, and then um, the fourth one is called uh, label smoothing. Basically, in training, not testing, in training, you kind of smear the label to create some noise, and then you do your training. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, finally, there's a, a way of, uh, you know, it's called just do it. Okay. Um, and, and it's that uh, <coughs> un unreasonable effectiveness of noisy data for, for, for fine grained um, recognition. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> but in this case, in fine, fine grained classification, uh, the label, label noise doesn't affect the performance because in your testing data set, there's no noise, okay? Anyway, so now what did we do? Uh, in this latest work we did is we, we try to um, incorporate knowledge graphs to combat noise, okay? That's the main idea, okay? Um, in particular, we want to address the noise uh, caused by text ambiguity, okay? And that's one way. The second way is uh, we try to remove the ambiguity by using visual similarity. So I, I'll tell you some detail. Uh, of course, we create a new data set uh, to, to test our ideas, okay? Uh, so um, what are knowledge graphs, okay? Um, ImageNet, it, you know, the structure of the ImageNet is a knowledge graph, okay? Uh, so you, you can have, you know, this is, you know, all the concepts organized in a hierarchy, okay? And then um, you can have different uh, examples, visual examples at different level, okay? So in any event, this is one way of getting knowledge graph. We also have another way to, to build knowledge graph. That is by visual similarity. Basically, uh, we use, you know, deep features, whatever, and you can calculate the uh, similarity between different classes of concepts. If they are close enough, we we, we draw a connection uh, in in a knowledge graph. Okay, so we have two type of knowledge graphs. One that's based on human knowledge, semantic knowledge. Two that's based on um, visual similarity. Okay. Uh, so um, let me give you one idea. The idea is. Okay, we want to make sure that we have a way to eliminate the noisy labels, okay? Uh, so for example, for Willet, uh, if we um, look at these things, in general, we don't have a good way to uh, remove the, the, the uh, we, we can tell which one is not good, okay? But in other cases, we may be lucky, okay? So um, that's fine. <clears throat> so how do we actually do it. We, we borrow this idea of distillation. Uh, so that's the scheme. So basically we have a base CNN, okay, um, and then a primary CNN, okay. And then, um, um, and then we have two different kind of losses. One is called imitation loss, uh, one is called primary loss, and then we combine the different loss functions, okay. Okay, so uh, in terms of distillation, there are different ways of doing it, okay? The, f the original way, now this is Jeff Dean's work, uh, basically they have, um, they use uh, expensive strong CNN ensemble for the base CNN. And then for the uh, primary CNN, they use weak CNNs, okay? And then um, in the uh, second type of distillation, uh, they use, uh, the base CNN uses privileged features and the primary CNN use generic features. Our work is different in the sense we, um, for the base CNN, we use a small set of clean labels to train the base CNN. And for the primary CNN, we use a large set of noisy labels. But we use the uh, knowledge graphs 
to reduce the level of noise, okay? Uh, so compared to the previous one, you, you can see that we added this yellow box, okay? That's, that's knowledge, external knowledge, okay? Which can be used to modulate the, uh, the amount of no, uh, noise. And in particular, uh, this prior knowledge is given in the form of knowledge graphs. And we tried, like I said, we tried two types of knowledge graphs. One that's based on semantic knowledge, the other one based on visual similarity, okay? Uh, so um, the intuition basically is, is uh, you know, using an ensemble, okay? So um, if we have, <coughs> if, if we're looking at the, the bird concept, then conceivably, uh, we're going to get a good response on other birds categories, okay? Each column is a bird category. But if we look at the, the person, the name, then you're not going to get a, cons a similar or consistent response across uh, similar uh, classes, okay? That's how we can tell there's noise or there's no noise, okay? And then this data set we constructed consists of uh, 260 seven class, uh, classes, okay? Uh, there's a species data set, there's a sports data set, okay? And then uh, we use the common mean average position um, metric to evaluate the performance. Uh, so th these are the results which, which I think uh, worth talking about. So we, we can add a different amounts of, uh, um, we use different amounts of uh, clean labels, okay? So first, we only use 20%, and then 40%, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, so uh, then we use noisy data to complement the, the clean data, okay? Uh, so as you can see that, um, first of all, if we use more and more clean data, obviously we get better. Uh, but at each level, um, by adding noisy data, we also get better than just using the clean data, okay? Oh, uh, this, this one is, this should be blue because it's all clean data, okay. <clears throat> and then we compared against other um, distillation methods, for example, cross entropy, bootstrap, label smoothing, reweight. So, and in our scheme, we have three, three uh, variations. One is just basic distillation. The other one is semantic knowledge graph based distillation, and then visual knowledge graph guided distillation. Uh, so you can see that, um, basically, I don't have to talk. So the, the highest three curves, uh, th this is a semantic um, um, graph-based distillation. This V, the highest one, is the uh, visual knowledge graph-based uh, distillation, which turns out to be better than semantic knowledge-based distillation because here, you know, our primary goal was to get rid of noisy labels. And it turns out using visual similarity is more effective than using semantic, semantic uh, knowledge graph. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, this is uh, essentially the same results sh showing different combinations of clean data, okay? Uh, and then uh, we can rank image. This is ranked image by the baseline. So uh, we have some errors like this ones. Okay, these are the highest ranked images already. Okay, and then uh, these are the results based on guided distillation, guided by knowledge graphs, either semantic knowledge graph or visual uh, knowledge graph. Uh, so. <coughs> Basically, we were able to show that, uh, you know, we could uh, um, really make use of noisy labels if we incorporate external knowledge, either through semantic uh, knowledge graph or uh, visual knowledge graph. Uh, so uh, we, 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 um, we obviously, we want to extend the work to larger data sets. Uh, to, to conclude, um, I just want to come back to the, the, the point I made in the beginning. So there's this constant war between people who 
say data is great, uh, or people who say model is more important. Okay, uh, so um, right now it seems to be that the, the data people are winning the war, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure. Okay, <laughs> uh, so I guess what's more important for us as researchers? What do, what should we do? Um, we don't want to be sort of stuck between Google and something else, okay? Uh, so um, people say data is king. I don't debate that. I think data is king, okay? Um, but um, the, this great data divide I see, okay? The data rich, okay, Google, Facebook, they can come up with lots of data. They, they can, or they can hire a lot of people to label the data. Oh, <clears throat> the rest of us, um, we have to live with uh, uh, noisy data. But I think um, <coughs> if, you, if you don't try to solve the problem yourself, then it's tough. You can only be a follower. So whenever someone releases a big data set, you can jump on it and work on it. Okay. That means you can only be a follower, okay? I, I don't think we all want to be followers, okay? Uh, so, um, but the, the other issue was, um, even if data is king, but should we be more practical? You know, some people can afford it, but we don't have to. I mean, just because you can do it that way doesn't mean it's the right way, right? So I have this cartoon here, so right? You can kill a mouse with a mouse trap, or you can kill a mouse with a rocket, okay? Um, but as humans, we, we can do learning easily with small data, incomplete data. And I think that's still very much worth uh, our time and effort to pursue, okay? Uh, and that's actually the, the motivation of this uh, tutorial, that we, we cannot say that now we can afford to get the best quality images, the best quality labels, and that's all we do, okay? But uh, we have to deal with reality. That is, we can't always afford or get highest quality images, highest quality labels, and therefore, um, we still need to, uh, to solve many challenging and interesting um, machine learning problems. Uh, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. Um, I think we're a little bit over time. But you guys already stayed long enough. Okay. Uh, any questions? Oh. Okay. For me, uh, the last two are really for us to build a base platform mm -hmm. with a small scale, with data. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but for the other big ones, it looks like they are basically using machine learning methods. They are not using the same data to build a network. Which one? Other baselines. Right, right. I think you have a good point, but I think just a second. Let me see. This um, mm, others, yeah. Some of them can live with no clean label data, but what I'm saying is. Uh, uh, at least we prove one point. So uh, a little bit of uh, clean data can, can, can carry you a, a, a long way. You know, it's, uh, it's sort of like we don't have to artificially tie our hands and say, we can't do any clean data, right? We can do a little bit of clean data and, and, and still um, be able to make use of lots of uh, noisy data. And that's one point we want to make. Yes. So, uh, so first is small text. Mm. I, uh, so I only have a very superficial knowledge of the knowledge graph. So mm. based on the limited number of knowledge graph I use, they usually just supposed to mass link or mass knowledge, that's the binary case. Mm. And based on what you describe, I get the feeling that you are using knowledge graphs within either of each, each pair of two concepts that will have pairwise similarity. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you mean the link is either on or off, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. But you, I think it's possible to allow, you know, non-binary links. In other words, you, you, you can have knowledge graph, but the edges, you can have a number. Yeah, but here you are using non-binary graphs, right? Yeah, we are using non-binary graphs. That's, that's a good question. I think, I mean, the graphs, we didn't have to build them manually, right? So if you, let's say you do the visual knowledge graph, you can calculate as many pairs of similarity as you want. And then you can either make them binary or sort of uh, continuous. Uh, so scalable question, I think, Right, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So, so you do have to pre-compute these things before you go in. Uh, otherwise, you don't have the external inform information, right? Okay. Right. Uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I read one of those. I, I think I listed two of those. The book is writing for knowledge enablement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we make, we make no assumption on the nature of the noise, right? But I noticed in your testing you are adding dotting, dotting noise in the label. Which part? Uh, no, no. I, I could be wrong, but... No, I don't think we, we that's what we did. Okay, so... No, we, no yeah, we make no assumption. But we are trying to use the knowledge graph to, to help us reduce the neighbor noise, regardless of what distribution that is. Because that's discovered through, you can say, big data, whatever, from somewhere else. And then if there's correlation, there is. If there's no correlation, there's no correlation. Right? So uh, we didn't have to assume that everything, uh, label noise is random and everything is possible. Not, not everything is possible. Right? right now, even though we are doing binary things, but conceivably we could do non-binary things. Yeah. Like, like you can take the confusion matrix of, uh, of classifiers and use that as, as uh, some kind of knowledge graph. Uh, 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 the opposite of knowledge graph. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. I didn't quite get your question. Semantic gap, you mentioned. Yes. Well, um, there shouldn't be any. If your semantic, if your knowledge graph is complete or comprehensive, there's no gap there. The gap, the semantic gap, you people normally talk about is between the concepts and features, not between concepts. So I don't know what you are referring to. In other words, we could have incomplete knowledge graphs, but that's a separate issue, right? So here we're assuming either we, we get complete knowledge graph somewhere else based on human knowledge, or we have, you know, um, we could exhaustively test the pairs of, of relationship and figure out which ones are visually similar, which ones are not. Um. Yeah, so the, the, okay, the semantic knowledge graph is built by human, so that's a different matter. The, uh, the visual knowledge graph is automatically computed, yeah, but it may not be cheap, but it's, can be automated. Yeah. Uh, I think I don't know. 
this slide. Uh, I think we, oh, we, we agree we're going to make the slides available, all three parts. Yeah. yeah. Any question for them? <laughs> now that you've seen all three parts. <laughs> OK, so I think that, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think on behalf of uh, all three of us, I want to thank you all for attending the tutorial. and. Um, uh, yeah, like we'll make the slides available and we'll be happy to entertain questions afterwards. Yeah, thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.